Hello and welcome back. This is Castlin and Always Acting Up. This is a podcast where I share all of my personal stories and journeys as an actress in the entertainment industry. Um, lots of crazy lessons that you're going to learn in between here and there. Um, this episode, I have a very special guest. She's going to tell us all about what producing a film is like. But before we get there, um, I want to give a shout out to all of you guys who follow along, who subscribe, who send me comments, messages, little love notes. Love it. And of course, this couldn't be uh, possible without my producer, Hisani Johnson. <laughs> Woohoo! And I'm very excited about this guest today. She is a friend of mine. And you know, sometimes when you have just friends who are in the business, you don't really like talk about the business that much. Um, and so we've never really had a chance to talk about like goals and where you want to go, how you got into it. And so I would like to welcome my friend and very special guest, Melissa Del Rosario. Hi, everyone. Hello, Caslin. Always a pleasure. <laughs> you get an applause too. Could you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> so, how hard, so how are you? I know you were working on a project just literally like last night, right? Is there a weird sound happening on your end too, or is that? Um, I heard music. Is that me or you? Definitely not me. Um, I have no idea what that could possibly be. Hold on. I am so, so sorry. What the fuck is that? Okay, it's gone. It's gone. I am so sorry. Did I mess it up? Did I mess the thing up? I was just like... There has not been a podcast where I haven't messed up yet. So, like, it's totally normal. Like, fine, whatever. So, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited because I feel like we planned for this um, a long time ago. And, you know, time and things and, and things happened. And so, here we are. Yay. I love the new studio space. It looks so great. I wish I was there in person. How do you like my shirt? Oh my gosh. I'm geeking out. I love it. Let me tell you guys about my <laughs> shirt. So Melissa is owner of her own company, Rosary Media. That is the shirt I am repping today. She is the producer of the Las Vegas 48-hour film festival. She produced a film in 48 hours hours that screened at Cannes at the official short film corner and American Pavilion for Emerging Filmmaker Showcase. And you guys, she is a producer of the award-winning film, multi-award winning film, Takeout Girl. Da -da -da -da! Yay! So you have um, like a bajillion accomplishments. And so I want to get into it right away. And I have a bunch of questions for you. So I hope you are ready. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm curious, um, and I've always been kind of curious um, what exactly the life of a producer is for a film. So, from the beginning, how did you get into producing? Uh, actually, I never thought I was going to be a producer, so it's really funny. Um, I internshiped with a company uh, when I was first starting out in college, and I started out as a PA. And my first day on the job, the producer told me that, like, oh, well, what do you want to be? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I think a director writer. And he's like, no, I think you're going to be a producer. I was just asking questions and helping out. I was the first one there, the last one to leave. Um, and a lot of that I feel like I incorporate into what I do now. So I guess, like, if you're going to say, what does a producer do on the day to day? The producers, oh, oh. Is that a separate thing? <laughs> Am I jumping the gun? So, um, yeah, I never thought I was going to be a producer. I never actually thought I was going to be into film, but I got into film because my best friend, he, uh, he passed away and he was an aspiring filmmaker. And he always would tell me that I should try to make films. Uh, filmmaking is creating your legacy. It's the stories that you have when you're gone or the stories that you leave behind. And it, and when he said that to me, I, I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, whatever. And then when he passed away, it all of a sudden clicked. It like made sense, you know, and I tried it. I took a film course at UNLV and now I'm still at UNLV, but really close to being done and making films. 
<laughs> that's so sweet and so sad. I don't know if you can see, but my <laughs> eyes are all <laughs> That's true. I mean, I think that's a great thing about movies is like it's a time in history and a story of people's lives that will last for forever. Oh my God, that's heartbreaking. Um, let me recover from that really quickly. So do you feel like you always sort of had like a love for movies? Definitely always had a love for movies. It was the one thing, uh, like, I mean, I think everyone has a different kind of childhood, but I feel like um, I had a pretty rough one growing up. And it's different when you can go to a movie theater and you can kind of forget what you're going through. You can kind of like get so immersed into a show that you forget like what's happening outside, you know, and that's what I used to love. I used to love going to movie theaters. I used to love going to plays as a kid because you're in a whole new world. And then you have to leave. <laughs> Do you remember what your first movie was at the movie theater? My first movie at the movie theater? No. I know. I know. I was like, I think mine was Jurassic Park. But apparently um, my mom was like, no, we, we took you to movies. You took you to movies before that. But the only thing I remember was Jurassic Park. And it was terrifying, <laughs> especially at the movie theater. <laughs> I feel like I've seen like everything. But I, I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like one of the reasons I want to ask you so many questions is because I feel like maybe I've mentioned it on this podcast before, but I'm so like, I can be a little bit of both, but I'm definitely type A. I'm super organized. I want to get my stuff done. And I feel like um, that's kind of what a producer is. Agree? Disagree? I agree. Produ most producers are definitely very organized. I don't think I know a single one that isn't, uh, but there's a lot of other skill sets that I think makes a producer stand out but I Kaslin knowing you I'm pretty sure you can be a producer and I'm pretty sure we're producing something together very very soon that I'm excited for I'm not gonna say anything because I don't think I could say anything yet but I think you're gonna be a great producer if that's what you want to do well I well I think down the future is something I want to do so what do you think like you mentioned that there's um certain like character um characteristics and things that make a good producer like what do you think those are I think a good producer is passionate. I think a good producer has an eye for story and has an eye for the right stories or not even like the right stories, but the right stories for them. Uh, they know their audience. They know quite a few people um, so that they can put their crews together, their cast together, uh, maybe financing, you know, um, now I feel like I'm rambling. No, I I'm sorry. I need rambling. <laughs> I definitely set myself up for that one. I think uh, characteristic. You're gonna cut this, right? Right. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So oh, great. Um, characteristics that I think a producer should have. They should definitely be passionate. They should be organized. Uh, they should be very good communicators because everyone has a question for you, and you're gonna be answering all of those questions. Um. You should be very patient because a lot of what we do takes time. We're there through pre-production to post sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's a few. I think, yeah, I think a little bit of everything. And I've like, I've, I've had conversations, like little text messages while with you while you were on set. And some of the stories I've heard, like, it's almost like you have like 20 different arms and someone's pulling at each each arm trying to get you to do this, do this, do this. And it's like seven o'clock in the morning. And then you'll message me and it's like 12 and you're still doing it. I'm like, oh my God, what is happening? What is going on over there? And I think it's just a process that you <laughs> and a lot of people just have to sort of manage. I think it's, I think it's so much. Yeah. The producers are there from the beginning to the end. And when I mean the beginning, like we're up at like 5 a.m. If the call time is 8 a.m., right? And everyone's like, oh, no, it's an 8 a.m. call time. We're up at 5. We're up three hours early. We're the first ones at location. We're the last ones to leave the location. And then after that, right, after the shoot's over, so say the shoot is like from 8 to 8, right? Now it's 8 o'clock at night, and you're like, okay, so I've been up since 5. The shoot went well, or hoping the shoot went well, and everything's here. All the footage is here. Now let's make sure all the last couple of things are taken care of. Have the talent gotten home? Has the crew gotten home? Has everything been returned that we rented? And it's like a million more things. So patience and energy and 
very passionate because I don't know anyone else who wants to be up from five to maybe five. I've, I've definitely done like 20 hour days before I've done 22 hour days before I've done days where I didn't sleep because I was just ready, getting ready for the next day. Yeah. Um, just bananas. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just so much. And so what I wanted to do, I kind of wanted to like a walk through like a typical day, like the process. And I know people are listening who are also kind of, you know, they think they might want to do it, but they're not sure. They don't even know how to get started, which I feel is the problem for a lot of us. Like, I don't even know where to get started. So how do you get the job in the first place? So a lot of the jobs that I have, I would, I felt like half of them I get referred to and the other half of them I make myself. So like uh, one of the jobs I first started doing, I guess, I worked under a production company and then I worked my way up from PA to producer. And then when I was a producer, any client jobs that they got, I would kind of oversee from beginning to end. And then after I got the hang of that, I started taking on my own clients or just, just you know, word of mouth kind of things. People will say, oh, yeah, so and so is a filmmaker. You have an idea, send it to her, you know? And then if it's something that I liked or something that paid, pays well and like is doable within a certain time period, then I'll take it on. Do you think that um, people who have like, they don't know anybody, they don't know anything, do you think they could perhaps just contact a local production company and maybe give them a resume, um, maybe do a follow up call and say, I eventually want to get into producing. I'm not sure where to start. Do you have any maybe internships available? Is that something that would be typical um, for someone wanting to get into it, maybe to just contact a production company? I think that's typical. I think I, that's what I did. Um, and inherently, I didn't do it with the emphasis on producing. But like, if that's what you reach out to them for, and they're famous for that, uh, everyone needs a little help. And everyone knows what it's like to start from nothing. So I definitely agree. That's a great start. That's a great try. Do you have to have like specific qualifications? Like, do you need a college degree or like a certificate? Or if you just really think it's something you want to do, could you just, just sort of um, apply and reach out? I feel like everyone's path is different, but I don't think that you per se need a college degree. I don't think, I don't think you're going to start out producing tomorrow. So if you reach out, they will probably have you as a PA. If you have no experience, you'll probably start out as a PA or a production assistant. You'll get used to being on set if you've never been on set before, because you can't just start doing everything if you have never done anything. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, I mean, yeah, I, I think if you've never been in like a movie set before, you have to kind of get your feet wet starting from the bottom. Yeah. And when I say starting from the bottom, like you were mentioning being like a production assistant, um, it sounds like it's starting from the bottom and it sounds like it's like not an important job, but it is probably one of like the most important people to have on set is a production assistant because there's just so many different things um, needing to get done and to have that extra assistant an extra person on hand is like hallelujah thank you so much for getting lunch or setting this up or talking to this person and getting this done super super important so we love PAs I mean I don't want to sound like the cliche producer but we call PAs rock stars because like if my hands are extended and I only have two hands and I have someone else that can run and grab lunch or that can run and do an errand for me like it's really awesome and if you start as PA my biggest advice for you is to ask as many questions as you can without being disruptive without like talking while they're shooting or anything but like take in as much information because maybe you might not even be interested in producing. Maybe you'll ask the producer all the questions on what they do and maybe you don't like that. And a lot of production assistants are really reliable and really good to have on. And like some people I think stay as production assistants too. Like it's not, it's not to say that like you have to be a producer is your end goal. You might be start on as a PA and be interested in cinematography or something else like production and design, you know? That's a really good point, actually, because I think a lot of times people are like, I want to be this and I want to be that. And especially the people um, I know some of y'all, you you know, you spend so much time um, going to school, going to college, and then you're like, I actually don't want to do this. And you've already spent so much time. So I think it's a really good point to bring up that getting your feet wet sort of really allows you the time to discover if it's really something you want to do. 
And on, on that note, if you can reach out to any colleges, a lot of college students, I mean, not right now in the pandemic, but any other normal time, college students need just as much help as regular production companies. And you can see it on a smaller level where it's not as much pressure normally because they're all students trying to figure it out too. So that's a good place to ask questions and figure out what they're doing, but not not always set it as the industry standard either. So so you're saying like to, that experience. So, so to go um, work on student films. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with student films. There's a lot of student films that go on to win like student Emmys or go to the same film festivals that we've gone to or, you know, like student films are cool. I, you might not get paid. <laughs> you most likely won't get paid for them, but they're cool and you get a lot of experience too. Sometimes you do get paid though. I, I am really surprised. I'm like, how do y'all get this? But I guess there's grants and things. But but yeah, student films are great because they're learning, you're learning, and it's kind of, you've got a question, well, guess what? They probably either know the answer or they don't know the answer yet, so they're going to find out. And like, you know how actors, I know when you're casting sometimes, you make Facebook posts or you go on Actors Access, LA Casting for actors. Is there something similar like that? for producers like is there a website where you're like let me put my profile and see if I can get some production work does that exist I mean I feel like there's a similar thing like not not like actors access but like staff me up I see a lot of like line producer positions posted on there um, creative producer positions uh, staff me up has that Mandy has that it depends on what kind of like work I guess work database you're looking for a lot of my stuff come from word of mouth. Uh, so I don't really, I have a staff me up account. I have a Mandy account. I have a LinkedIn, but I feel like a lot of my work come from people I know. So I lean on that heavily. Yeah. Well, and, and because you've been doing this for so long and you've been doing a good job, do you use like a typical resume or do you have like um, sort of a demo reel like we do with like clips from each movie that we've worked on? W what would be something that you would use? Um. <laughs> It's the funniest thing because like when someone reaches out to you and they already kind of know you, they they kind of already know you. But I, I've had. Can I restart? Start. No. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Jesus is terrible. I know. No, I'm gonna. Um, I I edit the video or no, I edit the audio. I, I know, but I I feel terrible. No, just have a conversation. Whatever. Like I literally mess up every single episode, don't I? I do. Okay. But um, I, I feel like I've sent my resume out a couple of times, but most people, it's kind of like, I'll get a job from the referral of the last job I just did. So if I worked with one person, then they know me from that job and they'll refer me out. Uh, for producing, I've never really had to send too much, but I do have like clips. Uh, I need to get my reel together. Mental note, I'm going to have a reel before June of this year. So I'll have that to send out, but it's mostly like word of mouth and referrals mm -hmm. but I've sent my resume once or twice I update that all the time <laughs> is it just as hard for you to get um footage back to create a reel because that's always such a problem for us actors is to get our material back so we can create a reel is it do you think it's easier for you or it's probably just as difficult because everyone's moved on like nobody wants to go back to that project and cut it up again they've sort of like all right on to the next bye see you later I feel like for me, it's different because I own all of the materials I produce for the most part. And I know all the people, if it's not me, I know who's handling the footage. So it's not very hard for me to grab that material. But I feel like for actors, I would make sure that it's in your deal memo or it's in your this and you know, try to ask who has the footage, like get the director's information, get the editor's information, like so that in 30 days or in whenever it's supposed to be finalized, you can reach back out to the right person because maybe the producer might have moved on at this point because I always have another project in the works. So I might have forgotten. And I don't want to like sound like that, but I feel like sometimes we forget the actors. And like if you reach out, you, we might have worked on, with a project on you. We might have worked with you on a project like two years ago. So we don't even know what reel you're talking about. Because I know I, I hear that a lot. Like, oh, that producer never gave me my footage. I'm like, I'm sorry they didn't. But do you have anyone else's contact information from that shoot? You know, because they might not even know. Because there's so many of us um, actors when there's like one or two producers. So we all know you. 
but there's like 3,000 of us. And I guess if you're, you know, moving on to the next, the next, the next, uh, it's kind of hard to remember exactly who, who it could possibly be. And so once you have the job, okay, you know you've been hired, what does preparation entail? Like, is it you get a couple days? Is it like 10 hours and then you're going to be on set the next day? Like, how long is typical prep if you're lucky? Like, what's an ideal <laughs> prep time? If I if I'm lucky, I would love I mean, it's it's always per project. So every project is different. But I would love at least two weeks of pre-production before every project. I'm lucky sometimes if I have 24 hours of pre-production. I'm lucky sometimes like I got called for a shoot that's happening in March in January. So I got two months, but now I'm just like waiting, you know, so it's it's the weirdest thing. I, I feel like every project is different. But pre-production, uh, you can do it in a short amount of time or as long amount of time. It just depends on what what they need from you, essentially. Do they need you to gather crew? Do they need you to gather cast? Do they need you to hold auditions? Do they just need you to be on set and like watching over, overseeing, making sure there's no no fires, taking notes, making the the reports, the end of the day reports? Like it it all depends on what kind of producing work you're doing. Do they tell you beforehand, like, I need you as a producer and I just need you to do this, 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 and this? Or do you kind of like, you sort of establish what positions you're willing to fulfill? Um, or you just kind of get on set and see what needs to be done? Normally, it's the it's the first. They reach out and they say, we're looking for a producer for this kind of project. This is what we need. This A, B, and C are what we need the producer to do. Are One, are you available? for those dates, because this is the dates of the project. And can you do it? And what is your rate to do it is pretty much and then the, the conversation starts. I don't really ever sign on to a project with them saying, Oh, like, we want you to be a producer, and then show up tomorrow and just figure it out. Because then I'll also come back with my 20 questions like, so what is it? What's the dates? What are the hours? What are the times? What is the rate if you have one set aside? That sounds super stressful. Oh, no, it's, it's not. You have to be very detail oriented <laughs> to do this. Detail oriented. I think you also sometimes have to know like which questions to ask, because sometimes I feel like the production may be new or it may be a new director. So they're relying on you at the same time. So I think I think that may be a lucky situation also, because then it can be collaborative and you figure out at the same time. I don't know. And so <laughs> once you get on set, um, what do you do? Are you in charge of certain people? Like, what do you do? Oh, like, I know you said that? you get on get on set like super, super early. And what are you prepping? It really depends. It's like project for project. So like for the feature, right? So for Takeout Girl, I was on set and I was also, we had a script supervisor and she was awesome and something came up and then we didn't have a script supervisor. So every day that I was on set, I was now script supervising. So, and it's, it's just, everything is different. But I think the biggest thing that most producers can agree on is you're on set, you're making sure all of those pieces that you put together in pre-production go the way you thought they were going to go during production. So if anything comes up and, and everything and anything will come up on set. So you're going to try your hardest. Like if you do all your work in pre-production, no matter how great of the job you do or, or what you set together, something always goes wrong on the day of production. You might have cast the, the greatest actress and she's amazing and she's never let you down ever once. And then you show up and she's a no call, no show. No one can get in contact with her the day of production. That might happen. Yeah, like that. That has, what? That, that has definitely happened with an actor that we won't talk about because it's really not important and it was really hard and we just and then you as the producer you have to talk to the director talk to if there's any other producers if there's someone above you if there's an executive producer or if there's a client you guys have to figure out okay so do we cast someone else right now do we stop do we reschedule like it, it's a lot of fires um that you kind of put out all throughout the day so like sometimes it's not as crazy as that it's not as crazy as the actor but sometimes there's a piece of equipment there was one shoot that I was on where um, we were using a teleprompter and we were waiting for the teleprompter to come in and they were missing like a piece of equipment because it wasn't attaching to this to the camera that the DP was on. And so we had to send someone out like the best solution was to send someone out to go buy that piece of equipment. 
because it would be faster than having the person go home, get, pick it up and then bring it back. So we had to send someone to go buy it, bring it back, set it up. And now we're behind by an hour. So now my job is what can we do to speed that up? Can we move lunch up? Can we can we change this around in the schedule? Like, are we still going to make our day? If we're not going to make our day, what's the plan? Do we come back another day? And it's it's all of these questions started by that one incident. And there's never just one incident. It's it's quite a few things normally. Yeah. And like once time gets bumped back, then I mean, and production's bumped back, then instead of going for like an eight hour day, you're now at nine hours. And then you got to start paying more money depending on the project. Dang, that is, that's super challenging. You know what blows my mind? And I think about this all the time because I've heard stories like this like fairly often about actors just not showing up like they just don't call don't show up like like what how like it's it's mind-blowing because you have you know actors like myself and you guys who are watching you would like give your left arm to be on set and then you hear about these other actors who are just like yeah um I just decided that this project wasn't for me anymore I'm like you couldn't figure that out like a week before what were you doing this whole time you couldn't make a phone call like it just blows my mind and what I've actually found is some of these actors have really good representation. I'm like, how? How did this happen? Like, what? Mind blowing. Just well, banana. Well, we're not always so lucky to be able to have Kaslyn Rose on set because if I could, I would cast you in everything. You're so professional. You're on time. You're wonderful to work with. It's it's just sometimes you you do get those actors who are highly represented and they have this great reputation, and then you get there. And they're not at all what you expected, you know, and, and you have to work with that sometimes or sometimes you can fire them. And if if you're a, I don't know, I don't want to be too weird, but I think a good producer would call out if they know they have representation and they wasted everyone's time. No call, no show. I would definitely call uh, their whoever's representing them and make a big stink about it. I would too. be represented anymore. Yeah, or cause those problems on other sets. I gosh, I can't even imagine. Well, and luckily, like, because there are so many actors, I would imagine that there'd be 300 other people that are willing to take that place, assuming they can in availability. So that's a that's a booger for you guys. Crazy, <laughs> crazy. And so um, once production has officially wrapped, maybe it was like one day, two days, 20 days, I don't know. Um, are you done with production um, on wrap day? Like, no, you're shaking your head. No. no. So what else needs, <laughs> what else you got to do? Well, normally I get hired and it's kind of like, this is the job. This is the video files that we want delivered to the client. Uh, and we want it delivered by this deadline. And it's not just being there, being at production, setting it up. It's also making sure that the files are edited. The files are of good quality. Um, the files get delivered to the person they're supposed to get delivered to and everyone is happy or as happy as they can be. Because there's some times where the client isn't exactly happy with the work or something goes wrong. I've heard of horror stories where like, it's never happened to me, thankfully, but like where like the footage is lost, a day's worth of footage is lost or this or this or that happens or, or say, and I mean, I, this has happened before where we didn't, we weren't able to get exactly what the client wanted. Like say the client wanted to shoot in Caesar's Palace. Well, to shoot in Caesar's Palace, that's a $20,000 location fee. So was the client willing to spend $20,000 to shoot in Caesar's Palace? No. So we shot somewhere else. And of course that didn't meet their expectation, but they were as happy as they could be for what their budget was and what they wanted. And we, we hit all the other marks. You know what I mean? But it, it's that follow through. It's we're never done. Like, and we're never done when everyone else is done. Because say everyone else, say the cast gets cast gets to go home first. You guys are the luckiest. Once camera wraps, you guys get to go home, change, get out of makeup and hair and stuff. And we're still here. The crew is still unpacking. The location still has to be brought back. Normally, we change the location because it's never film ready unless we're shooting right in the studio. So then the location has to be transformed back into what it was. You have to make sure that happens. Make sure all of the crew gets home. And yeah, and then you're still waiting normally on the edit and seeing overseeing how that goes. And if there was an on-site editor or if there's someone who who's waiting for the footage to start editing after the day is wrapped, there's that kind of thing to look out for. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what else. Like if, if you borrowed any equipment, it has to make, you have to make sure that it gets back to the equipment house or the rental house. Uh, and there's always paperwork, always, always paperwork. <laughs> Even something for like Takeout Girl, which is like a full on feature film, like you're still, I mean, you're not like working, working, working on it, but there's still things that need to be done. And when did you guys wrap? Uh, like, so like we wrapped, like, when did you guys wrap? Like a year ago, right? Yeah, we wrapped back in, what, January of last year? That was our last shoot. January of 2020. January of 2020, we had our final pickups. I want to say that was the last shoot day. Mm -hmm. And then we still had press, like, and it depends on the project. So if it's a client-based ad or something, that's how that goes. But if it's a feature film or if it's a short film, for Takeout Girl, we're still in the film festivals. Mm -hmm. We're still taking press. We're still uh, waiting to announce some really big news that the director, Sonny Johnson, gets to announce. I'm really excited for. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping to have a whole discussion about that on the podcast um, towards the release date so everyone can finally see what we're all talking about, like, all the time. Yay! Oh, please do it. <laughs> what was it like being um, a producer on that project? Oh, my gosh. That project, this project will always, it's my first feature film ever to start, and it will always be iconic for me. Um, everyone on the crew, everyone in the cast, like, I feel like we're all family. And I mean that, like, I feel like, like, I can't believe I was cast for that with you. Yay. <laughs> I still look back at that and I laugh like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> That day was so crazy. You know, we've had so many memories. We've had memories traveling together. We've had memories like just on set shenanigans. There were days when we were dancing, mm -hmm. <laughs> dancing in between takes. Those days are fun. Uh, there were days where the first day, do you remember the, were you, you weren't there for the first no, day. No, I don't think so. The location was so hot. That equipment, I think it was a boom mic that melted. That's right. Because we were, because we're in Las Vegas. It's like mm -hmm. 108 degrees and we're shooting outside. Oh my God. That's one of those stories where people are like, no, no way. Like, I don't even believe that. And you're like, dude, no, I'm serious. The we equipment actually <laughs> melted. Like, that's how hot. Because what does it get? It gets like 100, 115, 118. Like, it can get really stinking hot in the summer. And it, like, doesn't stop. Like, nighttime, like, it cools down. And it's still 100 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry. That, had <laughs> that was, But that was a funny day. Like, you know, when you look back and you laugh at it, that's when you know, like, that was fun. That, and that was fun. Like, there's not a crew member or cast member on that shoot that I wouldn't work with again. And, and I hope to work with all of you again. Blessing. <laughs> I definitely think so. Um, and speaking of challenges, you mentioned, like, boom mic. What do you think, like, as a producer, is there, like, and, you know, you're, you said you were kind of, like, what is it, blowing out flames? Putting out, putting out flames. Um, what do you think is, like, one of the biggest challenges of, like, being a producer on just any project? On any project, I think the best producers tackle um, being adaptive, really. Just being able to change at the drop of a dime with whatever's happening. Um, there was one shoot that I was on. It was supposed to be, we were shoot, supposed to shoot exteriors. It was planned like three months in advance. It was great. Everything was great. And then it was raining outside. It like never rains here too, which is crazy. It was like pouring rain outside, like, and it was all supposed to be outside. So <laughs> everything went out the window. Essentially, we had to get a brand new location. We had to move, have a big company move. Everyone had to move and uh, get resettled, and we had to pay a new location fee and like completely switch. And I feel like a lot of producers, like the best ones, can switch at at a moment's notice or figure something out or because anything will come up and you're in charge at this point mm -hmm. you're the person everyone's looking at like what do we do now and you have to have a cool head about it and uh be able to relay information to all heads of department and and keeping calm and i know you guys are listening um you can't see Melissa, but she's very young and she's actually still in school which is just mind-blowing like she's just accomplished so much and you're very poised for your age I'm sure you've heard that before very mature do you find it um there to be additional challenges being so young that people maybe look at you and they're like 
I'm not I'm not listening to you because you're a child. Do you have you come across that before? Uh, ageism sucks. So if I meet you, sometimes I get referred and I didn't like this was probably before Zoom was really popular. I would meet on the phone. Right. So there was one shoot where I definitely felt that from a seasoned DP. Uh, he was definitely twice, if not three. He was in his 40s, 50s. I'm in my 20s. Um, so I get to the shoot. It's a big client. It's I think it's IGN, uh, w- which is really cool for me. And we get there and he goes, you're the producer. You're Melissa. We spoke on the phone. And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm Melissa. You're, you're, you're so-and-so, right? Um, you, you met me here. This is the location. I'm the only other person here. Are, we, are you ready to meet the client? And he just goes, you're not, you're not her. And I'm kind of like, do you, what do you mean? He's like, you could be my daughter. You're so young. Like, and he just keeps going on. Like, how old are you? How old? Like, you can't be the producer. I'm not supposed to listen to you. He said that. And I said, okay, so do you want me to call another DP or are you ready to meet the client? Because the client is right over there. We have a shoot to do. It should be four hours and then we're done. And then you give me the footage and then we're done. And he shut up (laughs) and we went to go meet the client, but I was ready to call someone else immediately and it and it made me feel really bad and I just I didn't even answer his questions really but I it was it was kind of an enlightening moment because a lot of people when they see my face uh one I'm Filipino and Filipino Spanish and French so I feel like I have a young complexion just because of like my mix so I I definitely look younger than I am but (laughs) I don't need you to tell me what I need you to do that's why I called you. <laughs> you know what? I actually had a really similar experience one time and it was crazy to me because this is when I was doing a lot of photography at the restaurants and I got to this one restaurant. I set everything up and I go back to the bar um, so they can, because the, the manager was back there and I was like, okay, I'm ready when you are. And he goes, is the photographer here? I'm like, yes, I'm right here. And they go, oh, you're the photographer. And I'm sitting here like, yeah, I just, I literally said that when I got here and then I set everything up and he's I don't like I guess he's waiting for someone else to walk in but I'm like no hi like (laughs) it's me I'm here oh goodness gracious um yeah and so how do you handle all of this while going to school because I like I remember being in school just being like oh my god I can't like I just can't I can't do anything else I have to say I have to be thankful for my family because my family is very hardworking. I have a lot of uh, role models to look up to in my family. And I have had a job since fresh, since I was able to have a job. So since freshman year of, high, of college, I enrolled at UNLV and I also started my first job and I've never had a nine to five. So I don't know what that is like. I started my first job as a creative director at an interior, uh, interior designs shop. So we were, it was very similar to what I do now. Uh, It was getting a design, talking to the artist, getting that set up, getting it ready to be sold, selling it, and then doing all the paperwork after that. So I did interior design as a creative director, and I also did um, transactions as a real estate transaction coordinator. So I've always had a job (laughs) to make my own hours. That's amazing. I mean, it's super lucky. Um, Gosh, I mean, like... It, it sounds like you fell into place, but it also kind of sounds like you were meant to do it. Like you were going to be doing something along these lines no matter what. It was just a matter of being uh, in the right position and having the options available to you because you're so good at all of this stuff. And you've already accomplished so much. What are some of your like long-term goals? Like what would be like the dream job? The dream job would be like just making three or four movies a year. Like, I think that's, that's the dream job for me, being able to go from one, from one feature film to another feature film and having the ability to set them all up and travel. I would love to travel and make my movies. We've talked about this, getting you on as a location manager, (laughs) going to different countries. What about the location scouting? What do we we have to do that? We have to do that. Like I, I will take no, you will not be able to give me a no for an answer, Castle. We had to go location scouting. And so my background, I changed it up today. This is from the Philippines when I went, it's Warakai. So we have to go there. One of the top beaches in the world. And I know why, uh, from firsthand experience. So 
we should go we should make a movie in the philippines I- i'm ready <laughs> like if you ever get put on a job and they're like we need a location with a gorgeous beach and um it can be anywhere be like great i know where we're going and in fact i have an actress i don't even have to be an actress i just just take me just take me i'll podcast from there okay how does that sound i want you to be there with me i want you to be like okay well wait i have to call my location manager she's the best she knows all the places because we've traveled so many times like i want 10 years down the line for us to have like gone to all of the different beaches because greece right greece is one of the beaches it's like my number one on my list yeah we have to go (laughs) <laughs> I cannot wait. I mean, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and so do you have any advice for people who are listening who may want to get into producing? Um, <laughs> if you want to get into producing and you're listening, I would definitely say that you should reach out to any producers in the town that you're in. I would reach out to any production companies that you're in. That was some, like a really good scenario that we were talking about earlier and to just get a feel for it, ask all the questions that you can ask and uh, don't don't settle if someone can't give you an answer um, ever. You'll find out if you want to be a producer very quickly uh, if you do that, because there were times in my career um, where like the reason I started doing movies at Eclipse Theaters, it felt like my university wasn't supporting me. I was asking, how do I how do I screen my own work? How do I get feedback from professionals? Where do I go to do these things? And it was kind of like, oh, you could try to submit to the film festival circuit, maybe. Oh, you can maybe uh, screen it once a year or once a semester at our annual screening thing that you have to pay to do that. And maybe you might not get in. And it was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to keep asking this question until I find an answer. And then I started doing my own screenings. And that's that's kind of like one of those things I feel like a lot of producers you guys are problem solvers and you're, you're natural problem solvers. So like you're going to be hit with all the problems possible, but you're going to find a workaround. And I hope to work with you if, if you're an up and coming producer one of these days. <laughs> yes, actually. Um, do you have, um, I, I guess you do have a website, like a way for people to contact you if they wanted to reach out with any questions. I do have a website. It's rosarymedia.com and uh, there's a contact form on there. <laughs> check out Kaslin's shirt but uh if you yeah if you want to reach out on my email it's rosarymedia at gmail.com and on instagram and facebook and everywhere else it's rosarymedia so you'll find me pretty easily perfect and i'm gonna go ahead and um drop that information in like the comments and stuff below and um i'm excited for our final moment of the podcast is our moment of positivity Yay. And so I know you've listened to my podcast and you were actually featured in the trailer of my podcast, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, you were. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So I was like, you know what to do. You've heard this part before. Everything I thought just went out the window. (laughs) Uh, That's fine. You can take a moment. Welcome to podcasting. Everything I had in mind, just I turned the camera on and I forgot. Mm Mm-hmm. I know. And so every episode, I have a moment of positivity where I like to share um, just some positive moments or like if I'm having like a crappy day, how do I get through it? Or maybe a silver lining to a crazy story. And I would be absolutely honored if you had a moment for us. So very, very recently, I do have a moment of positivity. Um, I have been shooting something for the American Institute of Architects. It'll be out very soon. But I've noticed, or I have to restart, I have to restart. (laughs) (laughs) I was like going somewhere that I lost it. (laughs) No, I literally do that all the time. You haven't done it once, Kathleen. You haven't done it once this whole time. And I'm like messing up. This part's easy because I just have to ask you questions and let, let you talk. So. Okay, so uh, a recent moment of positivity has been that I've been able to, through the American Institute of Architects, interview not only my grandfather, but feature a couple of my cousins in um, something that's going on their national website and going on all of their social media. And I've noticed like, so it's for, it's to raise awareness about architecture and promote diversity in architects. 
and hopefully inspire the next generation of architects. And it's really inspiring to me. And I, I, I'm very thankful to think that every day there's like new, diverse stories being told every day. There's more diversity uh, being shown on screen. And there's just been so much progression. Another small moment of positivity, if I can do two. Yeah, do two. So many plans. <laughs> I have so many plants. I highly recommend if you, I've never had plants before the pandemic. And after March of 2020, I started collecting plants, as you you know. So now I have like 60 something plants. Oh, my God. We started off with like just a couple. Every time I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going plant shopping. I'm like, again? Where are you going to even put them? <laughs> Oh my gosh. And, and it's funny because you're like, where are you going to put them? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I get it. And I'm like, I'll figure it out when I get home. <laughs> so I have all these plants. And like, I highly recommend to anyone who doesn't have a plant or if you have a ton of plants and you just need a reason to go get one more, just, <laughs> just go get those one or two or three plants. They will brighten up your house. They'll brighten up your environment. And today is Sunday and I do watering day on Sunday. So I water them and I talk to them and I know they don't talk back, but they give me some really fresh oxygen. And I don't know, like, it's cool because I can be really stressed out and I can just like look at my plant and be like, oh, it's so pretty and it's so bright. And I created this life and I sustain this life every week by watering it and taking mm -hmm. care of it, you know? Well, it keeps you on a schedule. But I would ha also have to agree that the benefits of plants, um, it's very therapeutic. I personally like looking for them. Um, there are some that are air purifying, so it's good for you to breathe. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I just like the green. Like the green is like, and we live here in the desert, so it's just dirt and rock and like a little bit of green. But like having the green in your house like brightens up your day. So I would agree with that. So everybody, if you need something, go get a plant, right? <laughs> get a plant and look it up because they have some really interesting facts about them. How many, I've given you a money, you slash Hassani a money plant and, and Alberto a money plant. And now I have like all these little pups coming off my money plant. And that's like really good luck and really good fortune. And every plant has some interesting little fact about them. So it's fun. Oh, I love collect them all. Collect them all. Do whatever you have to do to feel good about your day and to keep on going. Fabulous. Well, that's the end of our podcast here. Is there any additional words you wanted to leave with us? Thank you so much for having me. It's been so wonderful. I didn't think that I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> you can you guys melissa gets very nervous when we do uh interviews and stuff like that so she's always like practice with me read these questions do these things and i was like no this will be fun it'll just be a conversation and i really hope you guys got the answers that you were looking for if you were maybe thinking about it didn't know where to start didn't know like exactly what it entails so i hope you got all those answers and just remember any additional questions um email her would you say rose Ray's me rose Ray media at gmail.com perfect and i'll include that below and you guys um smash the like button subscribe do all that fun stuff and i will catch you on the next one <laughs> you're done? done oh my god that was so stressful i don't know why i don't know why i always get this way but you know when i'm in person i could talk forever you know, I could, you know, I could talk forever. You know, I'm a good people person. If we were just in like somewhere else and there was a hidden camera, I would be talking to you about everything forever. That is and so then, funny. Like, so awkward. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And then I kept trying to tell myself, look in the camera and then don't fidget. And it's the same thing, things that I was telling, literally this weekend I was telling like my grandfather to do and, and to not do. And then it, when you have to do it yourself, it's so much mm -hmm. harder.